You know, our, our, our theme uh, today is uh, God's calling, are you listening? And uh, wow, I, I was uh, at the Fort Square Church just down the road here. Oh, it must have been about 15 years ago or maybe more. And uh, I was doing a chalk drawing for a ladies group, all right? And uh, I was all done, and I'm in my closing prayer, and my phone started ringing in my pocket. And so I was a little embarrassed that my phone was ringing in my pocket, so I kept praying and praying and praying. I was wait- I'm praying until that stops ringing, okay? And so... And, and then when I finally stopped ringing, I said, amen. Every woman grabbed their purse and opened up and see if it was their phone. <laughs> so today, I deliberately left my phone in the office. <laughs> so, uh, but I had decided after that, if it ever happens to me while I'm speaking, my phone rings, I'm going to pull it out. I'm going to go like this and say, yes, Lord? <laughs> yeah. God is calling, are you listening? The call of God is an a, a interesting thing. In fact, uh, when, when you know, I was a college student, seminary student, uh, those of us going into ministry would will rest, wrestle with this thing about God's call. You, you know, and our missionaries, that uh, are missionaries of the month, the goods, uh, John had to really wrestle. He was in the, the pastorate. But God was calling him to go to Hungary. Wow. And and listening for God's call in your life. Now, theologians look at the call in two different ways. There is a general call, and the general call is when I'm preaching the Word of God, and I generally, at the close, try to ask you to do something about what was just preached. I'm calling you to respond to the message. And that's a general call. It goes to everybody. And, and you could say, that preacher's full of it. I'm not doing that. Are you kidding me? Or you can say, yes, Lord, what the Word of God said today. You see, you can, you can respond to that positively or negatively, right? That, that call. Then there's another call of God. It's the efficacious call. That means it's effective. When God calls, you cannot resist it. It's the irresistible call of God. We talked about this like a month ago. Lazarus was dead. He was dead for four days. He was in the tomb. They said he already was stinking. Okay. He was decomposing. Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. That was his call. Could Lazarus say no? We'd say, like, heck no. He couldn't say no. (laughs) He couldn't say no because Jesus, as God, was calling him infusing life into him so that he would come forth. And so we have to, when we read the scriptures, discern what kind of call is going on here. And and today, I'm not really talking about either one of those calls. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how God calls his people. In fact, Amos has already said that the Lord, uh, he took as his text, a text from Joel, that the Lord is roaring from Zion. And the Lord is roaring like a lion from Zion, Because a judgment is about to fall. And God is calling his people. In fact, it says he calls his people through his word. That's why I preach the word. God has promised to use his word. Not any funny story I could tell. No pop psychology that I might have. He has promised to preach his word. That's why I put it up on the screens. So you see that this is not me This is him. He he calls his people through his word. He says, hear this word of the Lord. This word the Lord has spoken against you. Ooh, against you. You know, sometimes the word of God comes with deep conviction. I can remember as teenagers at church, and we were sitting in a pew, and one of the kids was hanging on to the pew as tight as he could. His knuckles were getting white because it was the invitation time to come forward and receive Christ, and he was resisting that with all of his might. The word was convicting him so deeply that he was a sinner, and he needed Christ, and he was resisting. He said, listen, here's the, here's the word spoken against you. Oh, people, Israel. Israel, that's the people of God. I believe God uses his word every time it goes out. 
either positively or negatively, because it tells us in the Bible the word never returns void. So today, God, some, God has something to say to you. He's got something to say to me. He says, it's against the whole family I brought up out of Egypt. You see, God calls his people through salvation. They were in slavery in Egypt, and God rescued them, saved them from their slavery by bringing them out of Egypt. And you remember the story, parting of the Red Sea, it's in the book of Exodus, chapter 14. Moses lifted up his rod, and the waters parted, and the people went down through the water. They had to trust God that they were going to make it to the other side. So was there any doubt? Well, of course there was, because the Egyptians tried to follow them. You remember the story. And once the, the Israelites were safe on the other side, the Egyptians show up and they're going across and all of a sudden the waters come crashing down on them. You see, as those Egyptians were going into that water, they were trying to get to the other side on someone else's faith, the Israelites' faith. It does not work that way. The Israelites, as they went down, the waters were there. I imagine, I always imagine them teetering. And maybe with the wind blowing, a little mist of that water coming down on them, kind of like at the edge of the Niagara Falls. Maybe there was also a roar, I don't know. But it had to have been kind of a scary thing. And always tech, stepping out in faith in Jesus can be a scary thing. But it's so rewarding. Hear this word of the Lord that has been spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought out of Egypt, this group of people who claim to know the Lord. He says, listen, you only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. I just find this so fascinating. Everywhere in the Bible, it tells us that God has chosen us. God is a God of election. He chose us long before any of us ever chose him. You do know that, right? I only chose him because he first chose me. He chose me. That makes me very special to God. Now, when I read in the Bible, it's not thing to, in order to pat myself on the back and say, hey, good job, Dennis, you chose him. No, he chose me first. And I can't even say, good job, look, at he chose me. I must be something really wonderful and special. Because in Corinthians, it tells us he did not choose the wise, and no, I chose the dummies. So he says, God says, Dennis, I chose you because you're so dumb. <laughs> he didn't choose me because I was the strongest. No, I chose you because you're so weak. You're just puny in my presence. This is nothing for me to brag about. This is for me to say, oh, out of your marvelous grace, God, out of all the world of fallen sinners, you chose me, send the Spirit to convict my heart. So I responded to the gospel. He infused me with life and I believed and I chose you because you first chose me. Wow. God calls his people and through his election. But he also chose his people through discipline. It doesn't mean the road's going to be easy, folks. <laughs> Just read, read after Exodus 14 when God saved the nation of Israel. They were in the wilderness. I mean, it was, it was not easy. God doesn't promise you that everything in your life is going to be easy once you accept him. He just tells you that you're saved, your sins are forgiven, and you're on your way to heaven. A day is coming when you'll be glorified and everything will be absolutely perfect. But right now, you're on the journey. He says, hear this word of the Lord which is spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought out of Egypt. You only have I chosen of all the families on the earth. And he says, therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. I put the word punish in a little different font there simply because in the Hebrew it doesn't say punish, it says visit. Visit. Now there's a big difference between the word punish and visit, isn't there? My mom used to say when we were acting up, she'd say, you better settle down or I'm going to land on you. <laughs> land on you. Now, that might sound like a pretty nice thing. But in the context, I knew exactly what it meant. We had a paddle that looked just like that, except it was just a little narrower. 
And you see the signatures on that? We had a paddle just like that. It had signatures on it. Because once you got the licking, you were landed on. Later you get the opportunity to sign it. Once all your whimpering and whining and crying was gone, you'd sign it. I must say that my name appeared on it a whole lot of times. <laughs> it's about disciplining his people. We as a people of God get disciplined by the Lord. He visits us. And the New Testament puts it this way. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says this, Endure hardship as discipline. Sometimes we have hardship in life because it's the Lord disciplining us. Remember Jonah, Jonah who rebelled against the Lord and he, he did, wasn't going to do what God told him to do. And he went to sea, there was a storm and you know what happened, they finally had to throw him overboard, he swallowed by a fish. God was disciplining his wayward son. He was a prophet, he was a preacher and he wasn't going where God told him to go. And so circumstances in life got really hard for Jonah. Thank God I, I'd never been swallowed by a fish. And then King James said the fish vomited him out. Woo! Spit him out on dry ground. God was disciplining him. Listen, endure hardship. You've got problems in your life, you've got to do a self-examination. Is this just the consequences of life? Or is this the hand of God disciplining me, and the way you know the difference is your conscience is pricked that you know that you are guilty before him. Mm. He says, when you have discipline like that, God is treating you as a son. He's one of the kids. You're one of the kids. You're in the family. For what son is not disciplined by his father? Wow. It's the father's job to discipline the children. Boom. That's it. It's father's job. If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Wow. If my dad had never disciplined me, and my dad had another saying, it went similar to my mom's, said, he, I'm going to put a knot on your head so big you can't carry it. All right? Now, when he got to that point, you knew that he was really on the edge of giving you a firm discipline. Every father, if he loves you, disciplines you. If you don't love the person, you don't... Hey, when I'm in a grocery store and somebody else's kid is messing up, my kids would say to me, Dad, that kid needs a beating. <laughs> and I'd say, it's not my job, not my kid. But my kids knew if they acted like that, exactly what they would get. Why? Because they knew they were my kid. He says, if you are not disciplined, and everyone goes through discipline, then you're not really a child of God. I thank God for the difficulties that he brings into my life because it reassures me I belong to him. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Amen. Yeah. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respect them for it. It's amazing. When you're a kid, you say things like, I hate you, I, I'm not going to do anything you tell me. They go on to carry on like, like a kid. But when they grow up, they turn around and say, thank you, Dad, thank you, Mom, for intervening in my life so that I turned out the way I am as opposed to what those without such discipline. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits, God the Father, and live? Our fathers disciplined us, that's our human fathers, for a little while as they thought best. And you know what? i got to admit, as a dad who disciplined kids, I didn't always have the right information, and a few times I disciplined wrongly, incorrectly, and I had to go to my child and say, hey, daddy, you messed up. I didn't quite have it together. Will you forgive me? I, I, I should not have done that, right? Because I'm a human. I'm limited. But God disciplines us for our good, never for a wrong motive. You know, sometimes I discipline my kids simply because they were getting on my nerves. Ever happened to you? Okay, I know I'm not alone. Thank you. 
You never get on God's nerves. Isn't that amazing? But he goes on and he says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. This really hurts, Lord. I can't stand it. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Wow, God disciplines his people. God has called his people to save his people through the word by choosing them. And once he's chosen you, he's going to discipline you because you belong to him. I love this passage. Isn't this great? Yeah, this is great stuff. Second kind of call that God has, he calls his preacher. <laughs> yeah, God called me. I knew it. I knew it when I was about 12 years old, and I did not want to do it. And then about 16, he smacked me really good. Disciplined me, I should say. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, I became, my heart became more inclined to it. And then pretty soon... Uh, I found myself wanting to do the ministry of the Lord. And then I got to the point like I was like in your face, obnoxious about it. And I was probably turning off more people than I was turning on people to the gospel. And then the Lord mellowed my life out. And I accepted the call and I went to Bible college to refine my skills and seminary. And God calls his preacher. That's what's next in the text. He says here, do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? And the expected answer, it's kind of like the person says, uh, they're wanting a, a, a positive answer, and they ask you something like, hey, uh, do you want to go, do, do you want the World Series tickets that I have? I can't go. Whoa, and you respond, is the Pope Catholic? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Here he's saying, do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? And the answer is, no. Deeper in this is the whole idea. Uh, Amos is trying to lay a foundation. You cannot walk with God who's totally holy and righteous and good while you live in an unholy, unrighteous, sinful way of life. You cannot expect to be walking with God. No, it doesn't work that way. Does a lion roar in the thicket when he has no prey? Does he growl in his den when he has caught nothing? And the answer is no. <laughs> you know what he's saying? Deeper than this. The Lord has roared from Jerusalem. You know what he's saying? You're caught in your waywardness. You're not walking with the Lord. You're away from the Lord. You need to get back where the Lord is walking. The Lord's not lowering his standard to your sinful lifestyle. You've got to change your sinful lifestyle to his holy lifestyle. And he is roaring and letting you know. That's a little deeper in the text, you see. He says, does a, a bird fall into a trap on the ground when there's no snare that has been set? No, you've got, you got to put the trap out. If you don't put the trap out, he'll land anywhere he wants. But you put the trap out, you can catch the bird. Does a trap spring from the earth when there's nothing in it to catch it? No. Of course it does not. He's saying, warning, warning. You keep on going like you're going, and you're going to fall into the trap of the Lord's discipline. Boom. And you're going to really feel it. Wow. When a trumpet sounds in the city, do not people tremble? And the answer to that is, yeah, they do. When disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? And he's saying, yeah, God is sovereignly in control of everything. Whew. This is all, and he's saying, so then, if, if that is so, if all that is so, he said, then this, surely the sovereign Lord, sovereign over everything, does nothing without revealing his plan to his servant, the prophet. Wow, he's been building this whole thing up saying, listen, God has put his words in my mouth and I'm just a mouthpiece for God, preaching the word of God. You see, they were ignoring the prophets who are declaring the word of the Lord. And he's saying, "You stop, stop. Folks, I'm just a preacher. Sometimes I say some things you don't like. I'm just the messenger. It's 
That's why I put the verses up there. If you say, oh, no, I think he's got it wrong, well, go by the word of God and not by me. You know, I, I told someone a while back, it's kind of like when you eat watermelon, right? When you eat watermelon, you spit out the seeds. <laughs> you, you don't eat the seeds, you, you spit them out. You stay with the word of God. You say, no, no, the preacher's got that, I think the preacher's got that wrong. I am just trying to tell you what the word of God is saying. But if it is what the word of God says, then you better, you better conform to the word of God. I am just a messenger. Listen to what he says. He repeats his, his line. The lion has roared. What I'm telling you, as a prophet of God, I'm quoting from Joel chapter 1, or in chapter 1 of Amos, he says, I, I, I use this as my text. The lion has roared. The Lord is roaring from Jerusalem. Who will not fear? He said, you should be shaking in your boots because he's roaring, which means impending judgment is coming. Whoa. The sovereign Lord has spoken. He says, so this is what he says. I got the word of God. Who can but prophesy? I can't stop prophesying. I can't stop preaching. I've got to tell the truth. I don't care what happens to me. I've got to proclaim the word of God. God's called a preacher. It's not an easy task. He called him to the northern kingdom. It's, it's like a guy from the south coming up and telling the northern, northerner he's doing everything wrong. And you say, you know what? Why don't you get out of here and go back to where you came from? Because they didn't like what he was saying. Next, God calls his eyewitnesses. He has some eyewitnesses as we move into the text here. You see in chapter 3, and verses 9 through 10, the witnesses are summoned. They get their subpoena, and he says, uh, Proclaim to the fortresses of Ashdod and to the fortresses of Egypt. That's the Philistines and the Egyptians. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want them to come and tell me. I want them to see this for themselves. Here's the perspective I want them to see. He says, proclaim to them, assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria. That's in the northern kingdom of Israel. Come up on the Israel uh, mountains that overlook in the valley. You can see the little town of Samaria. See the great unrest within her and the oppression among her people. Israel is a terrible witness for the Lord. And he's calling the Gentiles to look down on it. The unbelievers look down. Look how wicked my people are. If there were a jury today and God were to call in all your co-workers, your neighbors, and your family, and uh, they were the witnesses, and uh, they were to see and expose the way you really are. That's what's going on here. Wow. This is what God says. He gives the sentence or the verdict about their ignorance. They do not know how to do right. That's a sad state. When the people of God don't know how to do right, and he's exposing it, he said, listen, they hoard plunder and loot in their fortresses. He said, they're guilty. <clears throat> guilty. Guilty, guilty. You know what? And I know every one of us are guilty, for we're all sinners. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But it's one thing to know that you're guilty and do nothing about it. And it's quite another thing to know that you're guilty, confess it and repent and turn from it. God calls the witnesses and next he calls for judgment. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says, an enemy will overrun the land and he will pull down your strongholds and plunder your fortresses uh, this is a relief from the Assyrian Empire, and you can see him there with a battering ram tearing down the walls of the, of the Samaritans. And you know what happened? He, they, they took, they're, they're, they're going to. It hasn't happened yet. He's preaching to them, repent or else. You're going to get a spanking, and if the spanking doesn't work, then you're going to get a grounding. If the grounding doesn't work, <laughs> you see what's going on here? He cares about his people. And so the Assyrians come and they carry the ten tribes of the north away into captivity. They're called the ten lost tribes of Israel because they never returned. Not like the southern kingdom went into captivity in Babylon and then God brought them back into the land 
after 70 years captivity, they never returned. They're overrun by an enemy. And this is what the Lord says. As a shepherd saves from the lion's mouth only two leg bones or a piece of an ear, so will the Israelites be saved. The ten tribes were gone. There was a small, little, two bones, a little bit of an ear that was left in the land. It was a Assyrian's custom to transport the population they captured to another place, <clears throat> take that captured people and bring them back to the other place. <clears throat> so that little remnant that was left in the land, the two bones and the ear, they wound up intermarrying with these Gentiles that came from the other lands, and they became half-breeds known as Samaritans. Ever heard that term? The Samaritans. And they had a corrupted worship of the Lord because it was filled with paganism and idolatry, and they called it Yahweh or Jehovah. He said, those who sit in Samaria on the edge of their beds in Damascus and their couches, there can be a small few that will be in the land, Mm. hear this and testify against the house of Jacob. Jacob is Israel, the northern kingdom, declares the Lord God Almighty. On the day I punish Israel for all of her sins, very interesting, again, the word punish is the word visit. The day I land on them, the day I put a knot so big on their head they can't carry it. The day that I do that, when I visit Israel for her sins, I will destroy their altars at Bethel and the horns of the altar will be cut off. The horns are those little parts on the end and and those were significant to cut them off is to desecrate it. God says, I'm going to desecrate their altars because they're worshiping the wrong God. They're going to be cut off. They're going to fall to the ground. I am going to intervene in their lives. I'm going to do that. I will tear down their winter houses along with their summer houses. The houses adorned with ivory and destroy the mansions, and I will just demolish them all, says the Lord. <clears throat> this same thing is reiterated in the New Testament. And people act like, well, that was just Old Testament times. Those kinds of things don't happen in the New Testament. Oh, wait a minute. In 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, however, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but Praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. God expects his church to be holy and pure, good, righteous, a people who follow in the steps of Jesus. Here we got this protest sign. Look at it. Life begins when you stand up to Christian fascists. Whoa. You see, we live in a woke world today, don't we? We as a Christians, we stick to the Bible, the Bible, the Word of God. The Bible declares a lot of things to be sin that the woke world says, oh, they're okay. No, 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 you guys got all, you're just so old-fashioned. God assigned your gender the moment you were conceived. I love that they announced they're having a baby boy. Not because it's a boy, but because it's a boy. (laughs) That means it's got XY chromosomes, right? It's scientific. It's non-debatable. God assigned it. Our culture today says, oh no, you, you can choose what you want. No, you can't. Every single chromosome represented in every single little part of your body right down to your hair is screaming out what you really are. Now, you can protest God all you want all day long. You can do that. Doesn't make anything different than you're a rebellious sinner against God who made you in his image, and he made you either male or female, and it doesn't matter what you want to be, that's what you are. That's what you are. Even science confirms it. So we got these protesters at a time of judgment to begin a family of God. Do you think that the woke culture likes us? Not at all. This is the most difficult thing I do. 
I got to say, you're totally wrong, but Jesus loves you and he wants you to come to where you're supposed to be. You see, you are an image bearer of God. You are missing what God has for you by trying to be something other than what God wants for you. And they don't want to hear that, but God loves you and God... You see, they don't even want to hear that God loved you and made you the way he made you. The time for judgment to begin in the family of God. It's time for us to get on track. And if it begins with us, like with Jonah, if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel? Are you kidding me? I showed you this picture before. I, I drew it when I was about 16 years old. But it fits this text. And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, how hard? Let me tell you how hard it is for the righteous to be saved. Jesus had to go to the cross, lay down, have those nails pounded in his hands and his feet, be lifted up, suspended between heaven and earth, have a sword thrust through his side, have a crown of thorns on his head so that he was bleeding and dying to pay the price of our sin. That's how difficult it is to be saved. You cannot save yourself. You needed Jesus to bear the brunt of your sin, the penalty, and accept him as your savior. If it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinners who have no savior? Well, you either choose the way of life or you will choose the way of death. So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. I got a picture of a guy walking down the road. <clears throat> so he's walking down this path, and you can see it's in the, the canyons, right? And, uh, but as it gets a little darker, um, he's not finding his way as easy, and then it gets really dark. He stumbles, he falls over the edge of the, the canyon, and on his way down, he's route rolling, and pretty soon he's, he's not even touching anything, but he grabs hold of a branch sticking out of the side of the canyon. He catches it, and he's hanging on for dear life, and he's yelling, help! Not hearing anything. Help! And finally he hears a voice. Uh, what would you like me to do for you? Who are you? I'm God. Well, help me. Then let go. Is there anyone else up there? <laughs> That's funny, but isn't that the way it is? Finally, in desperation, you're really getting weak, you're tired of hanging on. You let go. And immediately, the hand of God grabs you and pulls you out. Wow. He's come to save us. He chose us before we chose him. Wow. He's disciplined us, but he will never, ever abandon us. Amen? Amen. Listen. <clears throat> That's the point of what Amos is saying to his people. God is calling through his word. He's saying, are you listening? Or are you looking for something else? Are you listening for his word that convicts? Are you looking for an easy way out? Is there somebody else up there? Are you listening to his preacher? Are you listening to his witnesses all about you? The testimony, how God's worked in their lives. And, and when, he, when they've gone astray, how they've fallen. But when they call on him, he helps. Have you listened to the witnesses all around you? Are you listening to his judgments? Listen, there's consequences for walking away from the Lord. Because two have got to be agreed. Listen, you've got to agree with the Lord. You've got to walk in holiness, in purity. You've got to have a relationship with him. Are you listening to his salvation? Are you calling today? God's calling you. Are you listening? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for the song we sang, Word of God, Speak. We ask you to speak to us. 
We've been in your word and it has spoken to us. And now we're dialing the operator's song, Lord. Jesus. We're calling long distance, but we know that you're not just far away. You're very eminent. You're right here when you hear us. Two or three gathered, you're here. You've spoken to our hearts today, each one in a different way, but you've spoken to our hearts. Your word did not come and go and not return with some power and meaning in our lives. You've told us it never returns void. Right now you're speaking to every heart. I pray in the the moments that we have here, just some silence, that each one will say, Lord, I want to walk together with you. I'm coming back in step with you, Lord. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. We call on you, Lord, because you first called us. We choose you, Lord, because you first chose us. Thank you, Almighty God. In Jesus' name, amen.